Friday, for all. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Allison Nalloway. Dr. Nalloway is an epidemiologist whose research focuses on the evaluation of vaccine safety and effectiveness and the surveillance of vaccine-preventable and other infectious disease. She's a distinguished investigator and associate director of science programs at the Kaiser Permanente Center of Health Research in Portland, Oregon. Dr. Nalloway received her master's and doctoral degrees in epidemiology from the University of Iowa's College of Public Health and completed a postdoc fellowship in epidemiology at Marshfield Clinic, Marshfield Clinic Research Foundation. So she's going to be speaking with us today about her research focused on evaluating HPV vaccine safety and effectiveness. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing a very rare sunny day with me. <laughs> so I really appreciate being here and we'll try to make it interesting. And please just let me know if you have any questions. We can make this somewhat informal. Um, so I don't know how to get rid of that square, but I, today I wanna just spend a little bit of time telling you a little bit about Kaiser Permanente and what we do at the Center for Health Research. And, with a goal of thinking about possible collaboration today. So I'll give you a little bit of an understanding of the resources that we have available and the work that we do. And then I will highlight um, what our resources can be used for by sharing some of the studies that I've done on vaccine safety and vaccine effectiveness. And I wanna leave a little time at the end for questions and discussion. And we will be here until 2.30 um, talking with, with you all too if you have questions as students in particular about how to work with us. So to give you a little bit of a background about Kaiser Permanente, I'm just gonna tell you a quick story about how our health plan was founded because I think it, it's kind of interesting. So back in World War II, Henry Kaiser was busy building ships, um, mostly up in North Portland, but also in the Bay Area. And what he was noticing was that his workers were getting injured on the job because it was demanding. Demand. Um, so they were getting injured on the job and also getting sick and taking time away from their jobs and to deal with their own sickness and their family's sickness. And he was paying a lot of money to doctors. And he had heard about this doctor, Dr. Sidney Garfield, who had run kind of an occupational health clinic down in the Bay Area. And the two of them got together and thought, well, why don't we try to bring health care to our workers? Um, so what they did was form a prepaid group practice, so Kaiser was kind of paying into this and supporting the insurance piece of it, but also had a team of doctors right there available to take care of these workers and their families. And it was a pretty successful model. Um, we like it and we really believe in the healthcare and the, the way we provide healthcare. And so Kaiser, after World War II ended and the shipyards closed, the health plan continued and opened to public enrollment starting in July 1945. So Kaiser Permanente has been around for quite a while and we're now pretty big. So we currently provide care in eight regions across the country. Um, we dominate the West Coast, so we've got two locations in Northern and Southern California. Here in Oregon, we also serve Hawaii Colorado, Georgia, the Mid-Atlantic region, so around Washington, D.C., and we recently acquired Group Health Cooperative, so we're now Kaiser Permanente Washington serving the Seattle area. So right now we have about 14 million members of our health plan that we cover. Uh, we all share a common electronic health record system that's an Epic-based product that's been customized for Kaiser. We call it Health Connect. That's available in all of our regions. And all of our regions have research capabilities, although some of them are smaller and some of them are larger. So the two Californias have very large research shops. We hold our own up in the Northwest. Um, Kaiser Washington also has a really strong research program. The smaller shops are in Hawaii and Georgia where they only have maybe two to three investigators on the ground there. So talking a little bit about Kaiser Permanente Northwest, so our region, uh, we serve 600, about 610,000 members, primarily in the Portland metropolitan area, but we do go all the way up into Washington and up about Longview, Kelso is where we end. And we now have clinics all the way down I-5 into Eugene. And probably in the next five years, our goal is to get a clinic here in Corvallis as well as in Bend. So we are expanding. Um, importantly, 
and unique to the Northwest region, we also provide dental care. So in addition to having our medical members, we also have about 287,000 members who also receive dental care through our health plan. We own two hospitals up in the Kaiser, or up in the Portland area. So we have our patients seen there and we have access to inpatient records. We have a network of clinics. We have our own pharmacies. We have our own laboratory. So our goal is really to provide integrated healthcare. So we want to see people out in the clinics. We want to transition them into our hospitals. We want them to fill their prescriptions within our pharmacies, get their laboratory tests in our laboratories. And again, this is all linked by our shared electronic medical record, and people get an identification number when they join our health plan, and it just travels with them through their lifetime. So if there are any epidemiologists in the room like me, when I heard about this, I was like, that is awesome. That's so much data. Oh, my goodness. I can't wait to work at Kaiser Permanente. And it is pretty cool. Um, so a little bit about our research center. Uh, we've been doing research for a while. We were established in 1964. Um, we have a center in Portland, and we also have a center in Honolulu. So sometimes we get to go over to Hawaii, which is pretty nice about this time of year. Um, in our Portland office, we have over 250 employees, including 40 doctoral level investigators working. We have a $45 million budget. And almost all of that money comes from external sources. So we don't receive very much money from the health plan itself. We're actually out there writing grants, um, getting contracts, working more like an academic model. So um, we have a lot of federal partners. We get some money from industries and foundations. But our biggest funder overall is the National Institutes of Health. So this slide is pretty busy, but it's just meant to show kind of the breadth of the research areas that um, we cover. We have people working in mental health, genetics, genomics, um, health services research, health economics. We have an oral health research program, um, substance use and abuse, women's health, which is why we came down to talk today with some of your faculty members here. And we're conducting epidemiology studies. Um, looking at our comprehensive electronic medical records data. We do clinical trials work, including ones that are embedded in the delivery system. So we call those more pragmatic trials. So we're out there working with our clinicians to deliver care and interventions to our members. We do a lot of mixed methods and stakeholder engagement research, and I'll touch on that very briefly today. And one of the, again, one of the cool things about our our, our, our region in particular is that we can do this integration work looking at medical care and dental care. Um, I don't know why we have this artificial divide in this country between dental and medicine, but we do. And that certainly is just artificial because your mouth is part of your body and there's so many connections between the two. And we have this great opportunity to study those connections. So a little bit more about our unique resources um, at Kaiser. I'm going to talk about our research data warehouse, some of the amazing specimen resources that we have. I'll talk about our research clinic, our qualitative research core, and then maybe I'll ask Jillian to come up, my colleague Jillian Henderson, she can talk about our evidence-based practice center briefly. So, I want to talk about our data because I just told you that. It was amazing and really got me excited. Um, but there's a lot of misconceptions about Kaiser data. A lot of people think, oh, there's a Kaiser database. Just go tell me how many people have cancer and why they have cancer. Well, the problem is there is no Kaiser database. Um, our Kaiser database is really about 10,000 related data tables that underlie our electronic health, care, health record system and many other sources of data. And this schematic is really confusing. I put this up here just to make the point that it's really confusing. In my personal research, I'm only using maybe this piece of it right down here. I honestly couldn't tell you what all those acronyms stand for and what those other sources of data are necessarily. Um, but this is kind of the underlying um, 10,000 plus tables that make up our electronic me medical record system with some other things brought in, including um, vital statistics data and some um, geocoded data and census data. So there's no easy button. Um, it takes a lot of technical skill 
um, and programming ability to harness all these data sets together and make them into something useful. So that's what we have, we, what we call our research data warehouse, and we have about eight people who work on this full time in our research shop. And what they've done is take that whole big mess of data and distill it down into slightly less messy data. Um, so our research data warehouse right now is composed of about 55 plus, we add more tables um, kind of monthly, um, but they're relational databases that contains genderized data variables that we can use for research purposes. So these are tables that include things about health plan membership. When did people join Kaiser? When did they leave? Did they have Medicare, Medicaid? What type of enrollment did they have? We have information about people's demographics, so age, gender. Um, we're beefing this up and including things like marital status, sex partner information. Um, I wish we had occupation, we don't have that, but that would be a really awesome variable to have, but we have a lot of demographic information. And then we include all of the diagnoses that people receive in our clinics and hospitals. We also have all of the diagnoses that people are receiving through other providers that come to us in the form of insurance claims. We have information about procedures, laboratory tests, and what's really nice about our system is that we get not only that a test was ordered, but we can see the results. So we can look at that information. We have pharmacy prescriptions. We know when something was ordered and when someone filled it within our pharmacy system. Vaccines, that's my area of interest. Um, not only do we get information about vaccines received at Kaiser Permanente, but we also partner with the state immunization registries in Oregon and Washington so we can get data about vaccines our members are receiving outside of our system. We have a vital science um, database that has information about blood pressure measurements, height, weight, um, I don't know, oxygen saturations. There's a whole bunch of things that go into that that every time people are coming into our clinic systems, we're collecting that information. And I'll also mention that we have some disease-specific registries. So we have a big registry of our diabetes patients. We have a registry for our chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease patients. We have a really nice pregnancy registry, so that shows us people who are pregnant in the past as well as currently pregnant women. And I think of relevance to you, we also have an, an HIV um, patient registry as well. So some of these data sets are updated daily, um, so then whenever someone comes in and gets a diagnosis or procedure, we know about that. There's a 24-hour re refresh cycle on those. Some of them are updated weekly, monthly, quarterly, and some of them are updated annually, but we do have access to some real-time data. And I will say that most of these data elements in our data warehouse are common across all of the Kaiser regions, but there really are important regional data sets or differences, and it can be sometimes challenging to work across the regions of Kaiser um, because we all kind of function as independent units. So we have to do things like data use agreements with each other and IRB approvals and contracts, um, which is kind of a pain, but um, that is the, the possibility to work across regions and touch all of those 14 million members is there for us. So that's our data resources, and I want to talk a little bit about our specimen resources. And uh, we have what's called the Northwest Research Laboratory. And this is a research laboratory that has specimen processing and freezer space available. Um, right now, we have over 60,000 specimens in our freezers from about 40,000 individuals. And those specimens range from blood, plasma, serum, extracted DNA, and then we have a whole um, collection of cervical vaginal lavage specimens in our freezers. And I want to mention a couple of collections that we're housing right now. So, uh, we started a project back in 2009 that we called the Northwest Biobank, and here we were going out and collecting uh, blood specimens from our members. It was a goal of building a data set for genetic studies, and that data set is linked to our electronic medical records. So those participants gave us a broad consent to go ahead and look at their DNA and go ahead and look at their electronic medical record system for any type of genetic study that we wanted to do. And so right now we have about 25,000 individuals that have been consented into that biobank. Some of them have DNA already extracted and some would actually need to have the DNA extracted 
um, from their samples. And then another nice collection that I think might really interest some of you here is a study that we recent uh, a collection that we recently acquired from the study of uh, study of osteoporotic fractures. And in this study, we recruited about 2,500 postmenopausal women. They were recruited way back in 1986 and 1988. And they have been followed longitudinally up until I think 2016 was the last year of that study. And we have specimens from them at multiple points in time. We have really rich survey data on them. And we have the linked electronic health records data on them. And the study was obviously designed to look at osteoporosis, but they did a lot of uh, surveys around nutrition. Um, there's a lot of cognitive testing that happened in this cohort too. So this is such a treasure trove um, for anyone who's interested in aging and older women in particular. And this is available to us <laughs> for, for use in studies, and we really haven't fully explored that um, outside of us. The osteoporosis question. Yes. Yeah. The um, consent is applies also to, for uh, researchers from outside Kaiser. It does. So it is. It's totally open. Mm -hmm. uh, any research, but any by any research. Yeah, they had a really broad consent um, for this particular study, and we have control over 2,500 uh, 2,500 individuals at our site, but there's 9,000 total people in this cohort across the country. And so if anybody was interested in that full cohort, we could certainly facilitate some collaboration with the, the other two sites as well. So that is a gold mine <laughs> waiting to be tapped in my opinion. So just toss that out there. Um, we also have the cervical vaginal lavage cohort, and this includes about 20,000 specimens that came from women um, who were undergoing pap testing at Kaiser Permanente and back in the 80s. And these data were sent to the National Cancer Institute and were used to really demonstrate the link between human papillomavirus and cervical cancer. And we got all these specimens back from NCI about two years ago. They rented a refrigerator truck, or freezer truck, it was actually a freezer truck, and brought all the specimens across country back to us and, and dumped them in our laps, and we had to find some freezer space for them. So we have these, and again, um, I will say for this particular cohort, the consent is a little more challenging. Like we would probably need to go back and, and consent these people for genetic research, but that is available, and we can actually extract DNA from these, these CVL specimens. So nationally, we are also working on the Kaiser Permanente Research Bank, and I honestly can't remember if our goal is to get 250,000 members enrolled in this or 500,000. I think it's 500,000 is the goal. And this is a national Kaiser um, effort, so all of the regions are participating in this. Again, it'll be a general consent for um, genetic research and linkage into the electronic health record. Um, all of these samples will be housed at Northern California Kaiser down in Oakland, and there's a national committee that governs access to, to the use of these specimens. And I will just say, I think the process for access to these specimens right now is, is actually fairly onerous, um, but again, we could help facilitate that if people are interested. So in addition to all of kind of the blood specimens that we have housed, this will probably interest any cancer researchers in the room. So we have what we call the Northwest Tissue Library. And here we have access to over three and a half million um, individual formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue blocks. And this can be from normal or um, tumor tissue. And this database um, goes all the way back to 1971 to present. And it's just an amazing resource for cancer research. Um, these specimens were collected for clinical diagnostic purposes, and then they go into this ginormous warehouse. Um, and people always look at us funny when we have a line item in our grant applications that says forklift driver, because um, we literally need to pay a forklift driver to come in and retrieve these um, tumor specimens off these big these big pallets and find them for us. But they're very well organized and cataloged and available for research. 
And the really nice thing about this is, again, you can link this back to the electronic health record. And we also have a very nice tumor registry data that we use to supply the, the SEER program, the state cancer surveillance program. And this tumor registry provides additional information about the course of uh, cancer care after diagnosis. So it has information about staging of the tumor, treatment, survival, recurrence. And you also have access to all of the detailed pathology and cytology reports that go with these specimens. So if anybody wants to do cancer research, this is also a really underutilized resource and, and pretty unique. Uh, we're one of the only Kaiser regions that has this kind of level of detail and this kind of rich, rich data. So um, we do have what we call the Advisory for Biospecimens Committee. I used to chair that. Thankfully, I don't. I'm just a member of the committee now because it's a lot of work. Um, but we govern access to all of the Northwest Tissue, Lab Tissue Library and uh, research uh, library specimens. And we do have a policy for external collaboration and a way to review applications. And honestly, it's not too much of an onerous process. It's like a five-page form that you fill out. and then. Our committee meets monthly and gives it a thumbs up or a thumbs down for, for collaboration. So if you're interested, um, I'll show you where to find that on our website and I could help facilitate that process too. So I want to talk a little bit about our research clinic. We're fortunate to have um, a dedicated space um, at our research offices that will allow us to do mainly clinical trials so we can do on-site data collection and specimen collection. Our clinic has blood draw stations. It has space for laboratory processing and some short-term freezer space. We have examination rooms, and we have a medication room so we can do clinical trials work. And I think most importantly, um, we have staff available who are well-trained in how to recruit participants, collect data, conduct exams, um, administer medication, and the like. And let's talk a little bit about a new um, group that we've formed at our site. Um, this is called the Qualitative Center of Research Excellence, or QCOR, and it's headed up by my colleague here, um, Dr. Kermit McMullen. Um, Kermit is a medical anthropologist, and she's brought a lot of unique um, expertise into our group. And they, this group offers collaboration and consultation on qualitative methods, which I've learned today you guys are all pretty expert at here too, but um, she does interviewing methods focus groups, um, bringing in her anthropology training, she does ethnography, um, stakeholder engagement, and user-centered design. So this is um, me and my colleague, Michelle Henninger, who wasn't able to join us today, but um, we are working with Carmeet on this uh, study that we did with our providers to help improve methods for HPV vaccination recommendation. And I have to say these methods, as an epidemiologist, I was kind of like, oh boy, <sighs> I'm not familiar with them. I don't know if I'm comfortable with them, but I had so much fun doing this project. <laughs> it was really great. And so she's helping us here um, sort all of the themes from the focus groups that we did with our providers. And then we did this user-centered design um, exercise where we pulled in all of these stakeholders and we started brainstorming about possible solutions to our problem, which in this case was how do we get our providers to make a strong recommendation for, for vaccination. And we were encouraged to put sticky notes all over and draw pictures and things, again, things that made my epidemiologist self cringe a little bit because I wasn't comfortable with it, but I had a really great time. And, um, we came out with some pretty interesting findings from that study. Jillian, do you want to talk about this, or do you want me to? Sure, I can. Okay. Um, so, I saw you be there. We have a large, oh, can you hear me? Oh, yes, yeah. okay, so you're doing cool. Oh, oh, sorry. Come on up here. This is Jillian Henderson. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, this is a group that I'm a part of. There are um, five PhD-level investigators um, that work in this group, and then a really great um, support um, and staff that, that support all the work we do. And we basically are one of 13 evidence-based practice centers that um, exist in the U.S. and Canada that are funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And our EPC is um, a little unique in that our focus is primarily on supporting the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. And those are the folks that you probably already know make recommendations on preventive health care in the state. So we go, they have meetings three times a year and we go and present um, meta-analyses and data synthesis from 
existing evidence to support their recommendation making. Yeah. So they're a big part of our center, bring in a lot of grant money for us. Um, also have a really nice um, library staff that supports this as well as all the rest of us working at the center. So if you want to learn more about us, here's our website. Um, if you click on the diverse research, that'll give you an overview of um, the work that we do. And then if you click on the our, the our people link here, it takes you to all of our investigator profiles. So this is mine. Um, some of them have amazing videos <laughs> that you can watch um, that tell you why we got interested in research and what type of work that we're doing. It has all of our studies and our bibliographies. So we have one of those um, website or web pages for all of our investigators. And then this capabilities um, button down here kind of talks about all those resources that I just shared. And if you wanted to get to the Advisory for Biospecimens Committee, just go through that capabilities link. And there's a, a link there to the policy for collaboration and the, the form that would start that application. So any questions about Kaiser so far? Spark any interest? Yeah. So in case one wants to start a collaborative work Yeah, so um, actually if you go, I think it's off of this page, there is a spot that says, do you want to collaborate with us? And it takes you to a really short red cap survey that you can fill out and we have people waiting to talk to you. And you fill out the survey and they will talk to you and try to match you up with someone. The other way you could do it is just hit me up after <laughs> the meeting. Uh, we can also have you go through the researcher profile page or our diverse research section. You can see what kind of topic areas you're interested in, what we're working on, and um, always cold call us too. Um, we're actually a pretty collaborative group um, despite our reputation. <laughs> I know we made it really hard to collaborate in the past, but we're really trying to change that and trying to reach out more to people. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the vaccine research that we do. This is um, my team at CHR, and we're a big team that kind of grows and shrinks as we have different projects come in, but we try to cover anything and everything related to vaccines in our research portfolio. So we've got clinical trials research, and our sweet spot is actually doing a phase three trial um, although I'm applying for a grant right now that would get us into phase one and phase two trials. Um, but we do clinical trials. We do safety studies, and I'll talk to you about that because that's a project that's been very on, long ongoing and a big part of my career. Um, we looked at vaccine effectiveness and population impact. We do surveillance for vaccine preventable diseases or just other infectious diseases. And we also do intervention work. And I don't have any real formal slides about the intervention work, but I'm happy to talk about that if we still have some time. So those are the types of studies that we're doing. And then within vaccines, we primarily focus on human papillomavirus vaccine, HPV. Um, we look at varicella and herpes zoster vaccines, so that's chicken pox and shingles. And we have a really large research program in influenza vaccination as well. And I should note that um, We've been doing a ton of work with norovirus too right now. We have this, that's another sample of a collection of samples that we have. If anybody wants to deal with stool specimens, boy, <laughs> let me tell you, we got like 5,000 stool specimens in our freezers. So um, we've been doing a lot of work in norovirus. And I think that as we start to develop a norovirus vaccine, we'll probably be doing some vaccine related research in that area too. And then another focus of ours is looking at vaccination of pregnant women, um, safety and effectiveness, and then also kind of knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs around vaccination. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of HPV just so everybody's kind of up to speed and the, the rest of the presentation makes sense. So HPV is really common. There's 150 different viral types, and about 40 of them um, infect your mucosal surfaces, so they're thought of as the genital HPV types. Um, it's the most common STI. Nearly all people who are sexually active are going to have HPV infection at some point in time and during their lives. And for most of those people, 
they will never know that they have the infection. It's asymptomatic. Their body will actually clear it and it will resolve. But there are people for whom the virus persists and can go on to cause cancer, anal genital warts, and papillomas in um, the larynx. Um, there are two types of HPV, 16 and 18, that are responsible for about 80% of the cancers. And there are two types, 6 and 11, that cause about 90% of the anal genital warts. And just to give you an idea of what types of cancers um, HPV is causing, so these are annual counts of cases in the United States. So it causes about 800 penile cancers, 3,300 vulvar and vaginal cancers, 5,900 anal cancers, um, just under 11,000 cervical cancers. So even though we have a fairly robust cancer screening, cervical cancer screening program in this country, we still end up with close to 11,000 cervical cancers every year. And then this one, the close to 13,000 oral pharyngeal cancers, um, that's actually on the rise. And this has now become the most important or most significant HPV-related cancer. You can see that it has now surpassed cervical cancer in numbers. And oral pharyngeal cancers can affect males or females. Um, it's actually on the rise in both genders. In addition to the cancers, HPV is also causing about 300,000 high-grade high cervical lesions. So these are like CNN, CIN2, 3. Um, so there's a significant burden on the healthcare delivery systems in treating these. And the important thing to take away from this talk is that vaccination can actually prevent over 90% of these cancers. So we do have a great prevention tool it's just not being widely enough utilized. Question. Yeah, for sure. The 90% prevention is on type of cancer or 90% prevention of people? Like, is it cross cancer type or is... Yeah, so it'll prevent 90% of these cancers oh. that are listed up here. Yeah, yeah. So, so let me talk about that for just a minute. So the the types of vaccines that are available. So the first one that came to market was what was called the quadrivalent HPV vaccine, and that brand name was Gardasil, marketed by Merck. And that covered 6 and 11, which are your genital wart-causing types, and 16 and 18, which are your primary cervical cancer-causing types. And then there's a bivalent vaccine license called Cervarix, and this wasn't used very much in the United States, and it wasn't used really at all at Kaiser. And that just covered the two cancer-causing types, 16 and 18. That was licensed in 2009. And now, in, since 2014, we have a nine-valent product, also called Gardasil. And this covers those four, 6, 11, 16, and 18, but it also covers 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. So that's where you get into the 90% of cancers are caused by these nine types of HPV. Um, so, the nine-valent vaccine is the only one being used in the United States right now. So, vaccine recommendations have changed a lot, and I'm just going to tell you what the current situation is. So, the current recommendations for vaccination are that you have a routine vaccination of 11 to 12-year-olds. So, people think, God, that's really, really young. Well, we know that kids actually start having sex around 13 and 14. Not a huge percentage, but a small percentage. And this vaccine is only designed to work as a prevention vaccine. It's not a treatment vaccine. So it's most effective when it's used before people are becoming sexually active. So right now, the routine uh, vaccination recommendation is 11 to 12 year olds trying to get those kids before they become sexually active. You can start the series as early as nine years of age, though. And then catch-up vaccination is recommended for males who are 13 to 21 years of age, females 13 to 26 years of age, and then gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, transgender people, and persons with immunocompromising conditions who are 22 to 26 years of age. And I don't know why we have to make these things so darn complicated, but we always make them very complicated. And these have shifted um, over the years since the vaccine was first licensed in 2006. So from 2006 through 2010, it was only recommended to vaccinate girls. And so in 2010, we had a recommendation to start vaccinating boys. And this is actually poised to change again, um, probably next month at the Advisory Committee on Immunizations Practices meeting. So back in December, the FDA said, 
you can use the nine valid vaccine in people up to 45 years of age, so men and women. And so now this ACIP group is trying to figure out if they're going to change the recommendations to allow for vaccinating older people. Older people. That I fall into that category. Can you clarify, catch yeah. up means you didn't have one before, it's separate, different from booster. So you'll yeah. need one. You, well, you're going to, I'll get to the dosing, but yeah. Catch it means that we didn't get you at 11 to 12, so we're trying to get you vaccinated. Yes. I was wondering why the change in recommendations, especially when it's going to people who are around that age, probably will be getting Exactly. So that is why there's not very much scientific evidence about that, and that's why I'm not sure they're going to make that recommendation because we don't think it's going to be cost effective to vaccinate those people because you're right, they've already been exposed, most of them. Um, but there may be pockets of people that haven't been, that this vaccine may be applicable both for, or maybe they've been exposed to one type, but not all nine of them. Um, so that is where we're going to focus our research in the next couple of years, is trying to help understand that and see if, where we can use that vaccine in that older age group. Great questions. So here's about the dosing. This is also really confusing. So this vaccine used to be administered as a three-dose series. Now it's not. Um, but you have to start the vaccine before your 15th birthday. So if you start your, the vaccine series before your 15th birthday, you only need two doses. So you get your first dose, and then you get your second dose six to 12 months after. But if you start the series after age 15, then you need three doses, and that is administered first dose. The second dose comes about one to two months after the first dose, and the third dose comes six to 12 months after the, third dose, or it's the first dose. So also super confusing. And this, is, um, this, was made, this dosing recommendation was made because we're really struggling to get people to get three doses. And the research has shown that these younger kids actually have a better immune response to this vaccine than some of these older kids. So, and there's some effectiveness data showing not only do they have a good immune response, but it is effective with just two doses in that younger age group. So this is a selling point um, for clinicians to use for getting those kids started and getting them vaccinated at the recommended ages. Because you can say, oh, you're 11 to 12, awesome, you need two shots. But if you wait, you're going to have to get three shots. So this is all very confusing. <laughs> but if you work in the vaccine world, this is how vaccine recommendations often go, and I wish they could be simpler. So now I'm going to talk about some of the research that we've done, and I'll kind of go through this quickly. But um, a project that's near and dear to my heart is called the Vaccine Safety Data Link. And we are a collaboration that's been in existence since 1990. I joined the project in 2000, so I've been working on it for a really long time myself. Um, we are tasked with working with the CDC to study vaccine safety. And here are our sites. Um, again, we're pretty much dominated by the Kaiser Permanente sites on the West Coast. We have Kaiser Permanente in Colorado, and then we have three non-Kaiser sites, Health Partners in Minnesota, Marshfield Clinic in Wisconsin, and then Harvard Pilgrim. And right now, when we pool all of our data together, we cover about 11 million um, uh, patients across the country. Um, so I'll tell you about some of the vaccine safety work that we've done specific to HPV vaccination. And this is a paper that we published on rapid surveillance for adverse events following HPV vaccine. So we looked at VSD data weekly um, from August 2006 through October 2009. And we were monitoring for eight um, pre-specified possible adverse events. So we were looking at Guillain-Barre, which is a paralytic syndrome. Um, stroke, venous thromboembolism, appendicitis, anaphylaxis, seizure, syncope, allergic reactions. And our data is pretty comprehensive and, and just great, and we standardize our data sets and we build these things weekly. So what we do is we go out and monitor on a weekly basis for these adverse events and using some really complicated statistical methods that were developed at Harvard um, specifically for like bioterrorism surveillance. We've used the methods here to look at our data weekly, and we're looking for counts of these adverse events that are above what we would expect based on historical trends in our data. So we looked at over 600,000 doses of HPV vaccine 
looked at those outcomes compared to background rates. And I'll just jump to the, the chase, this vaccine is safe. I'm going to say that over and over again in the presentation. We didn't find any increased risk of those outcomes that we looked at. However, when we did final, final uh, finish with the surveillance period, we did note that uh, there was an elevated relative risk of venous thromboembolism around 1.98. It wasn't statistically significant, but it was in our 9 to 17 year olds. And we thought that that warranted a potential follow-up study. And so I did that study. Um, and you can tell right from that title that gives it away, there was <laughs> no risk of VTE following hemopavilloma virus vaccination. Um, I think in my 18 years of this project, I have never published a paper showing a vaccine adverse event. It's all been null paper, null paper, null paper. So, um, which is good. We've only actually ever found three vaccine adverse events in the whole 28 years of this project. So vaccines are safe. Um, so in this study, we did what's called a self-controlled case series. And I'll just talk a little bit about, I'll nerd out on the study design just a little bit. But in, this is a study design we often use in vaccine safety studies where basically we identify cases. So in this case, we're interested in people who had either pulmonary embolism or deep vein thrombosis. And we take their, their time and we create these exposure windows after their vaccination. So in this particular study, we looked at the 60 days following uh, HPV vaccine exposure. What you do is you kind of divide up the person time for each person. So this person had two HPV vaccines and we followed them up for 60 days and called that their exposed person time. And then we looked to see, did they have a VTE diagnosis in that exposed window or in the unexposed window? So you create incidence rates for the exposed person time and the unexposed person time, and then create a rate ratio. And so we ended up with 156 chart confirmed vaccinated VTE cases. And you can see that our um, incident rate ratio was 0.92, not significant. So no, no finding of an increased risk of, of VTE after HPV vaccination. Um, sometimes we go beyond our electronic medical records to do vaccine safety studies. So this is a survey that we did um, of young women who had just received their uh, quadrivalent HPV vaccination. And we surveyed, I always, every time I do a survey, I end up at like 899 or 498. I never get a nice number there of my respondents. It just kills me. Um, so we surveyed 899 young women who had uh, just received their first HPV dose a few days earlier. And this was back in 2008. And we were asking them about potential adverse events that wouldn't necessarily make it into our medical record system. These aren't necessarily things that you would seek medical care for. And 78% of them told us that they had pain at the injection site. 17% they said they had bruising or discoloration. 14% said they had swelling. And 15% said they either fainted or they felt dizzy and felt like fainting. And this was not shocking. Um, these are really commonly reported adverse events following any vaccination. And what I didn't show on this slide was a lot of these girls actually received Tdap along with their HPV. And it was really the Tdap that was driving this. And I can tell you as someone who just got Tdap in this arm myself yesterday, that vaccine hurts. Um, so what we've heard is that HPV vaccine actually hurts when it's going in. Um, but it's the Tdap that gets you like a few hours and a few days later for pain. And also, this wasn't surprising with the syncope either. Teenagers faint a lot when they get vaccinated. It's very common, especially in girls. And it's preventable. Um, so there's a recommendation that when you vaccinate someone, you ask them to sit and wait for 15 minutes after vaccination and observe them so they don't faint. Um, this is a study I just published recently, and sometimes um, some of the adverse events that we look at are coming to us now from the internet and from social media. So this was something um, that was out there percolating on the internet. Um, there are a couple of case reports of women, young women receiving HPV vaccine and then their ovaries stopped working and they were infertile, and it just blew up on social media, and we had a lot of patients 
and their parents telling us that they were not going to be vaccinated because they did not want their daughters to become infertile. So we did this study. Um, I will not go too much into this because I know we're running out of time, but I think you probably know what the punchline is going to be with this. We didn't find any association. So here's, here's what we're looking at between um, HPV vaccination and premature or primary ovarian insufficiency. Um, no increased risk of that. And we also looked at some of the other adolescent vaccines. Um, I know that the, the risk is elevated here, but if you read my paper, we explain why we think that there are some methodologic issues there that um, resulted in that, that increased hazard ratio. So we are tracking down a bunch of stuff that's circulating out there on the internet. So people are having a real hard time getting people to accept HPV vaccination. I don't know why it's still treated as something special and different than other adolescent vaccines, but at this point in time, it's been around since 2006 and it's not new and it's just part of that routine adolescent vaccine platform. But there are some um, real concerns floating around. And some of the things that we see on the internet that we're now researching include complex regional pain syndrome, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS, chronic fatigue syndrome. And these things are really, really hard to investigate because they don't have really good diagnostic criteria. They have really insidious, long onset, and can take many months to diagnose. And so I don't know why we chose to bite these off at our site to tackle, but we have, and they're going to be really horrible studies. <laughs> we're just involved with them now. They're going to be very, very challenging. Um, but we're doing them because there is so much public concern about these conditions. And then we also have a study um, looking at syncope and HPV vaccine. But this one is really targeted at looking at the injuries that might occur after someone has a vaccine-associated syncope. And this was triggered by that survey. So one of, one of the girls out of my 899, um, she actually was vaccinated, left the exam room, walked out into our clinic reception area, fell, fainted, and fractured her skull. And she ended up in our emergency department and then in our hospital for about two weeks, had amnesia, had a skull fracture, it was bad, and we could have prevented that. And so this study is designed to look at those injuries that might follow vaccine-associated syncope and how we can prevent those. We've also done a rapid safety monitoring of the nine-valent HPV vaccine. And guess what? Safe. No adverse events reported. Um, we've looked at the safety of inadvertent HPV vaccine exposure during pregnancy. It's not recommended during pregnancy, but sometimes it happens that people are vaccinated before they know that they're pregnant. Also, didn't find any safety concerns. And then we did a big study looking at vaccination and autoimmune diseases and didn't find any relationship there. So I can tell you that the vaccine is a is safe and it also works. I'll just give that punchline away right away too. So how do we know that HPV vaccine works? Well, ultimately you want to be able to say that this vaccine prevents cervical cancer. That's what it's designed to do. But the problem is that it takes about 20 to 30 years between HPV ex exposure and development of cervical cancer. So we need some intermediary outcomes that we can measure to look at vaccine effectiveness. So one way you can do that is look at antibody response. We can also look at HPV infection. We can look at anal genital warts, and we can look at cervical cancer precursor lesions. And we've done all of that, too. So this is a study we published back in 2012. That was kind of the, the baseline study. We wanted to go out and see what, is, what does it look like out there? How much HPV do we have in our population? So, we did this study where we went out and cross-sectionally just sampled a bunch of PAP tests that came out of our clinical laboratory system. So our lab will process about 80,000 PAP tests a year. And what we did was we just went out for a couple of weeks and we pulled 2,000 of them out of the lab when they were done with the clinical testing. And we sent them off to CDC for their HPV testing. And we did this back in 2007. 
um, right after the vaccine was introduced, but in that particular um, period of time, we limited ourselves to unvaccinated women so we could have a baseline um, measure of what HPV prevalence looked like in our population. And then we've done um, two separate uh, sampling periods, 2012, 13, 2015, 2016. We've got some ongoing sampling going, but this paper that we've got currently under review compares those two um, periods with the baseline period. And what we've seen is that for the vaccine type HPV prevalence, so that's 6, 11, 16, and 18, we found that there's a 78% decrease in that prevalence in the 20 to 24 year old females. So these are women who had an opportunity to be vaccinated themselves. And we also noticed that there's a 38% decrease in the older women, the 25 to 29 year olds. So some of them may have been vaccinated, but more likely there's probably some herd protection. Um, so that was our conclusion that this vaccine is providing some direct protection and also some herd protection. So just kind of decreasing the prevalence of HPV overall. And we'll continue to do this and we'll look at the nine different types of HPV that are in the vaccine now. And then um, I have done some anal genital wart studies and <laughs> they're really fun, let me tell you, <laughs> reading some of those charts. Um, so we've identified members uh, who are 11 to 39 years of age who had at least one calendar year of enrollment, and then we calculated the anal genital wart incidence by age group, calendar year, and gender. So this is kind of a, an ecologic study. We're looking at time trends over time. And what we did was conduct an interrupted time series using segmented regression. That's as fancy as I'll get with the stats today. To look at the incidence of warts, in the pre-vaccine period and as compared to the incidence of warts in the post-vaccine period. So for females, that recommend the vaccine came out in 2006, so that's kind of where we cut it. So our post-vaccine era is 2007 to 2016. And in males, that vaccine, came, vaccine recommendation came later. So we're looking at 2011 to 2016. And these slides aren't going to show up very well, but um, this is what it looks like for females, and I'll just orient you quickly to these things. So here's that dividing line, um, 2007, our post-vaccine era, our pre-vaccine era. And this is the trend in anal genital wart incidence prior to vaccines. And this, is, this dashed line over here is what that trend would look like in the absence of vaccination. And here's what the trend was after the vaccine came into play. So this is for females, different age groups. So 11 to 14 year olds, thankfully they don't have a lot of genital warts, so not much change there. 15 to 19 year olds, we saw a decrease. 20 to 24 year olds, big decrease in anal genital wart incidence. 25 to 29 year olds, and then 30 to 39 year olds, not much. Um, again, those women were too old to be vaccinated. So overall, there was a decrease in, in wart incidence in females. And here it is for males. And again, their line has shifted over here to 2011. And you can see that actually we had some, some real kind of increases prior to vaccine coming about. And we've seen some decreases after vaccine. And this graph right here is actually kind of interesting. This is 20 to 24 year old men. And most of these over here, this is prior to 2006, 2007. You see that there is an increasing trend in incidence. And then we kind of see even before the vaccine was recommended for boys, there's some slight decreases here too. So that's probably suggestive of some herd protection there too, vaccinating females. And then once we started vaccinating the, the boys themselves, even more <coughs> decrease. So this is, again, an ecologic study. Um, so subject to those types of limitations, but I think that's some pretty, um, impressive findings, and it's really consistent with what others are finding as well around the world and in this country. So my conclusions are that vaccine, HPV vaccine is safe, safe and effective. Um, and I really wanted to present these today as just examples of how the data and the resources that we have available to us at Kaiser allow us to address all these important questions. Um, and wide-ranging questions looking at safety, effectiveness, delivery of immunizations, epidemiology, surveillance, all these different questions. 
So I'm going to stop there. And I really meant to give you guys a little bit more time for questions, but we're going to be here until 2.30. So um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to address them now. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so in the context of the recent outbreak, Yes. Uh, are you currently taking any measures to ensure that your database can also tackle this kind of problems and identify folks on the site where uh, as they <coughs> concentrate, quote unquote, where it's more likely that it'll be a problem? Yeah. Um, so first off, on the surveillance piece, one of those measles cases ended up in one of our clinics. So we're now using our electronic health records database to find all of the people who had appointments at our clinic that day, and so we can contact them. So that's one way we can um, track the outbreaks. In terms of vaccine refusers, um, we have a lot of them here in Oregon, which is kind of awesome for me getting research dollars because I can say, wow, we have this problem, um, but it's not awesome for public health in this community. Um, we have a lot of different issues within our health plan that we've identified. So some people um, are refusing vaccines because they think it's better to get natural infection. Some people are refusing because they don't like big pharma or inorganic products or chemicals coming into their body. Some people don't believe in the safety or effectiveness of vaccines. Some people don't like uh, needles. Some people, we have a large Russian immigrant community that we serve, and some of our <laughs> East Portland clinics in particular. So they have a whole different set of issues around kind of mistrusting government, mistrusting healthcare, some language barriers. So it's actually really challenging to address vaccine hesitancy and refusal because there's many different reasons for that all kind of wrapped into that. But in terms of tracking it, um, there are some actual ICD-9 and 10 diagnosis, well, ICD-10 codes um, that can be used to track vaccine refusals. And we've done some studies around that um, where we've looked for people that have received those codes from their providers. So we know that the provider had a conversation with them and the patient said, I'm refusing vaccines. And then our providers go ahead and put that code into the electronic medical record so we can get at it that way. And then we've partnered, and this work has mostly been done by my colleagues in Kaiser, Colorado, but we partner with them on this. Um, we have this really complicated um, algorithm that looks, it's primarily designed for childhood immunizations, that looks at a person's membership in our health plan, and then it calculates the days under immunized or unimmunized, depending if they're either delaying certain vaccines or just refusing them outright. So we can categorize people by how many days they've been at risk because they're not being vaccinated. It's a really great question. It's hard to get at. Um, through our data, but we've made some progress with that, and it's also a really complicated question because there's so many different reasons that people are either hesitant or refusing. And I would say that we tend to find hesitant people rather than outright refusers, or there may be one, and it's usually HPV in particular, that they're declining. And oftentimes, <laughs> for the younger kids, it's the MMR, which Maybe people won't be declining that as much now that we've got this measles outbreak going on, but I, I don't know. Sometimes that just doesn't motivate people either. So oh. we have an HPV outbreak? Well, we have, <laughs> yeah, we've got an HPV outbreak. It's just too subtle, I think. I don't think people know, right? They don't know that they have it, and they don't see the effects of it for 20 to 30 years down the road, so it's not immediate enough. Yeah. Great presentation. Thank you. All this great information. With um, HPV, um, I'm just trying to remember the beginning half of your talk. Do you have a cohort registry or no registry for HPV? No registry for them, yeah. yeah. Thinking about it? Um, we can pretty easily just build it as, as, as we need it ad hoc. So we don't have a specific registry built for, for HPV positive people or um, even for CIN two or three. We do track cervical cancer, though. They go, that goes into our tumor registry. Yeah. 
Or I don't care if you guys are like the exact same time. So. <laughs> Um, taking your findings and translating them for different. Oh boy, that is such a just really demoralizing question for me to answer. So um, let me share this anecdote with you. So I am also I'm not only an employee, but I'm a member of Kaiser Permanente. So I get my own care. So there's so many times when I go in for care and people are like, Oh, where do you work? And I'm like, I work at Kaiser. And they're like, Where? And I'm like, In the research group. And there's like huh, what, we do research? I'm like, yeah, we're over in that building. Oh, that building. I'm like, yeah, we have like 300 people over there. And it's just so, it's so demoralizing sometimes because we have not done a very good job at taking our research and bringing it back into our delivery system. So that is a major push for us right now is how do we strengthen that tie with our delivery system because it's a great place where we should be able to take these things and roll them right into practice. But unfortunately, it's just, it just hasn't been that easy. And I think one thing that's a, what's really challenging about this is, you know, some of these research projects last two, three, five years, and the health plan is not on that type of timeline. They want something that's just like boom, boom, boom. And they're just going to try something, and if it doesn't work, they just don't even evaluate it, they just move on to the next thing that catches their eye. So we're having some problems kind of syncing up our timelines and our desire to rigorously evaluate something with a health plan, but it, it's, it's a shame and we're really trying to do better at that because we do really great work that could inform healthcare. Thank you for asking that question. I'm sorry, I don't have a great answer to it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much for your presentation. Yeah. Pretty, pretty uh, insightful and got me interested in this big topic. Uh, I just have a like a curious question. Like you mentioned, it took about like twenty to thirty years to develop the outcome. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking about uh, maybe some immediate outcome to like. So what kind of the intermediate outcomes you're thinking about uh, to measure in more studies? Yeah, so we've looked at the warts, and we've looked at the HPV prevalence, and we've done some work looking at antibodies, and I didn't talk about a study that we have ongoing looking at CIN2 and 3, so that's cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, um, so those are kind of early precancerous lesions, so we do have a study right now looking at those. And I'll probably do the actual cervical cancer study, and then I'll retire. <laughs> that, that was probably still, although I did see one person, there's one group that did publish on that um, fairly recently. So there are some attempts now to actually look at cervical cancer as an outcome. But I think we're just still maybe five to 10 years too early to do that. But short of that, there's not any other great ways of of, of so looking at that. cancer also often occurs when people who haven't had health care, and so yeah. are, are likely to be a lot of people who also have That's very true. Yeah, and there's also been people looking at changes in just cervical cancer screening because now we're like, oh, this vaccine is really effective, so maybe I don't need to get a pap test. You still need to get a pap test. You still need to be screened, but there may be some changes in those screening guidelines moving forward as more people are vaccinated. Yeah. Um, I just have a question. Now, since HPV causes different types of cancer, yeah. they might have different onset dates rather than from 30 years of cervical cancer. Would you think about maybe looking at laryngeal cancer or any of the other forms of cancer as maybe as a phase? They still all kind of have a pretty long onset period, but yeah, the the nice thing, and I remember I talked about our dental program, so we've tried to do an oral HPV screening pilot program in, in dental. Um, the problem is that finding that oral pharyngeal cancer is, is like a needle in a haystack. So when we surveyed our dental providers and we asked them, have you seen any oral pharyngeal cancer? Most of them are like, no, I haven't seen that at all. Um, so it's hard to find, and it would probably need to be kind of a national Kaiser study. Yeah, but it's a good point. Good point. Yeah. Um, I know most of your not a looked at stuff in the U.S., but if you worked in collaboration with any international agencies or anything looking at this? With HPV, um, 
No, we've presented a lot internationally and, and talked a lot with uh, Australians. So Australia has a really strong HPV vaccination program. I mean, their rates are up over 87% coverage. Um, so they've actually done a lot of the early impact work down there. So just haven't done a study with them directly, but had a lot of conversations facilitated with them. And I would say my only, I don't actually do a lot of international work because um, it's just easier <laughs> to go to this, this data system. But I um, recently did do an international flu effectiveness study um, where we are looking at the effectiveness of influenza vaccination and hospitalized pregnant women. And we needed an international collaboration to look at that outcome because it fortunately is, is very rare. So we looked at about 2 million pregnant women around the world and only ended up with 1,000 people in our, our sample, final, our final analytic sample. So I don't do a whole lot internationally. And I know that you all do here, which is pretty exciting. <laughs> Any other questions? So I think Jillian and I are going to stay, and if you guys want to come talk to us individually, or did we want to have some facilitated discussion, because we, we have some potential to talk about um, student internships that are available, um, any type of collaboration. Yeah, so